since uh, it's 601, might as well call to order the 6 o'clock uh, Mashpee Conservation Commission meeting for Thursday, February 24th, 2022. Is there any uh, business in the audience or on the phone that is not on the agenda? No. All right, Drew, if you could proceed to the pre-post hearing item. Sure. So the first pre-post hearing agenda item we have is the introduction of Aaron Copeland. Aaron is a Mashpee resident who has uh, submitted a formal request to join the Conservation Commission as an associate member. And um, I sat down and met with Aaron um, over a month ago, roughly about a month ago, just to go over what's, uh, what's involved with being a commissioner and um, you know, what the role involves and what the expectations are. And uh, so Erin is here tonight just to introduce herself to the commission members. And um, I'll hand it over to Erin if you just want to introduce yourself. Erin, give us some background and just, uh, you know, a description of um, why you'd like to join the Conservation Commission. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what's the uh, best way to start. My, my great-grandparents first came down to the Cape back in the 30s. My grandfather had a business over in Hyannis for many years. Um, a lot of my family's been here. So uh, my husband and I actually met here 15 years ago. We kind of wandered all over New England for a bit and finally come home. Uh, we came home to take care of my mother-in-law who was living with us until she passed last fall. But uh, we're finally back. Uh, in Mashpee and plan to stay. We've we've moved seven times in the last 16 years, so we're home and we're done. So uh, we want to really start getting involved in the community, and part of that, for me at least, is getting involved in conservation. Um, just a little bit about me personally. Um, I'm a person who is in recovery from a substance use disorder. Um, I'm about six years this year sober, and part of what helps me stay sober and really kind of expand my horizons has been running the trails around town, you know, just out in the woods, and it's just become part of my part of my program, part of who I am. So um, maintaining our <clears throat> excuse me, our town's conservation or our lands and and uh, you know our natural spaces is very important to me. Uh, I spent a, I spent the summer when I was 20 in Australia. Uh, working in a tropical reforestation program, I uh, spent uh, about six weeks planting trees and uh, removing species that had become aggressive to the indigenous species and reforesting with uh, the natural species. So it's been something that I've been interested in. And now that my husband and I are planted and no longer moving, I wanted to just get involved as much as I can. And uh, so this is this is uh, well, I guess the first step to set the meet you all. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for the story. I think there's um, some very familiar parts of what you had to say that would strike a chord with a great many of us. So thank you for sharing, and thank you for your interest in the Conservation Commission. Thanks. Thanks for having me. The commissioners have any questions for Ms. Copeland? No, oh, other than welcome, Erin. Uh, we're always glad to have people standing in the wings ready to jump in and pick up the ball if we should drop one. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to, uh, to learning more about it. Actually, I just state, and um, I, it's going to be an important component as well uh, as I lead people through the process of buying homes and selling homes down here and understanding the, the conservation issues that come up when you're purchasing. Real estate. So, I think it's uh, it's going to be important an important tool in my toolbox. Yes, it's thank you so much. Certainly good to have somebody uh, as a real estate agent too, because that's an important line of communication between you know new residents in town um, and becoming you know having someone as a real estate agent be familiar with and involved with uh, with the Wetlands Protection Act and conservation issues in town. So certainly a a niche that needed to be filled. So uh, if the commission doesn't have any other questions, um, the the next step is to take a have a motion and second for a recommendation for Aaron to become an associate conservation commissioner. 
And uh, if you do approve that or make that recommendation, we, we take that, we draft a letter for the Board of Selectmen, and then they do their, their review. And then um, pending their approval, uh, Aaron will be sworn in as an associate member. Oh, in a uh, rare move for me as chairman, I'd like to motion that we consider, uh, recommend Ms. Erin Copeland for to the selectmen to be a conservation commissioner. Associate. I'll second that. Mr. Chairman, I think it says in the paperwork here, associate. I don't know. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Just trying to give her a promotion already. <laughs> <laughs> I modify my motion to uh, associate uh, conservation commissioner. Second. No second. Thank you, Brian. Uh, now voting. Paul. Yes. Brad. Yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron. Um, welcome aboard, and feel free to stick around if you if you want to uh, participate in the meeting. Uh, we'd welcome you to do so. I would love to. I've got a ten year old birthday party to plan for tomorrow, but if you don't mind, I'll, I'll meet you at the next meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. My son's just upstairs. I'm trying to get ready for the twenty kids to show up. Oh yeah, <laughs> we better get going. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. Right, Welcome so, both. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right. Hey, sir, if you'd like to proceed with our pre and post items. Uh, I think we can move on to the first hearing um, at this point, and then we can go over those items at the end of the hearing agenda. <clears throat> Sounds like a plan. Now calling the 6 o'clock hearing for John S. and Carol D. Kelly, 174 Captain's Row, proposed pool and patio installation with mitigation plantings. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This is an NOL. Mark Dibb, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Can you hear me? Whenever you're ready, Mark. Okay. Um, Good evening, Mark Dibb, civil engineer with Cape and Islands Engineering, uh, representing John and Carol Kelly at 174 Captain's Row. Uh, we filed a notice of intent for, uh, to obtain a permit to install a small plunge pool with small patio at the rear of the site. Um, this is the plan in front of you. So the um, site is founded on uh, Captain's Row to the north, and... Um, the Mashpee River to the south with residences on both sides of the property. Uh, resource areas on site consist of the uh, water resource areas with land on their ocean, land containing shellfish. Then the salt marsh is shown on the plan along with an area of coastal beach. And then uh, you come up um, out of the flood zone on a coastal bank. Um, and those are uh, shown on the plan. And so the proposal tonight is that gray and blue uh, rectangle hatched area is the proposed pool and just a small patio around the uh, house side of it and the west side of it. Um, and there'll be no additional patio on the south and east. Um, and as you see, there's also a hatching in that over that pool. There's a small area that is actually um, on the coastal bank, and uh, that represents about 96 square feet. And then the rest of the pool is uh, the entire area right now is lawn. And so the pool is the pool is proposed in that area. Um, on the left of the plan is a waiver mitigation table. So we uh, calculated all the impacts. Uh, both on the bank and in the zero to five feet, uh, five to 10 feet, and 10 to 15 feet. So we, the, the work consists of 364 square feet of work, but it results in mitigation and uh, of around 1,800 square feet. So then the next step was basically uh, to provide that mitigation, the green hatches on the plan. I'll actually touch on the light green hatches are the um, the mitigation areas uh, relate to your local bylaw and waiver request. 
Um, so that is uh, approximately 18 or 1900 square feet, uh, which will be some grasses in one area right next to the pool. That first area we call mitigation area one would be some native grasses, um, as well as then the rest of the areas are native shrubs, and there's some details on what those are and plantings uh, for those areas. And then the second, uh, the last resource on the site is uh, the river, and the river, this entire site is within the uh, riverfront area, and the work proposed is also in the riverfront area, and uh, that's metabolized uh, in the uh, summer table as well. And um, the site is currently over the threshold of either 10,000 or 10% 10 or 5,000 square feet of degra degraded riverfront area. So to um, offset um, any work, uh, we're also providing this dark green uh, mitigation, which is actually restoration um, within a shell area that does not have any loam, so it's considered a degraded area for the pool and patio proposal. Um, and lastly, we did receive um, a suggested comment from from Drew. I don't know if he had that draft plan, but we also implemented some additional mitigation between um, there's, a, there's an interface between the salt marsh and the coastal beach. You'll see some rocks. That's basically just delineating that area. Um, we provided about another 100 square feet of mitigation above and beyond what's required in order to just do a, a protective buffer, I guess, um, in addition to what's there between the salt marsh and the edge of beach. Um, I did just submit that today. so. Um, and uh, therefore, we believe we meet uh, the thresholds and waiver requirements for this project, and that the project is uh, worthy of a notice intent from the commission. Um, that's what I have to present on this. If you have any questions, I'd be like to, happy to answer. Thank you very much. Drew, comments? So I'm just going to show the commissioners some um, images of the site and then I'll get into my comments. So this is the property here, this is the Mashpee River. Uh, you can see there's that coastal beach area. These are some upland planting beds in here in this area. I'll have more photographs to show you. That's just the general proximity area of where the proposed pool is. So the, the site, um, getting into some of the photos here, top left is an uh, image of the existing single family home from the driveway side. Uh, this top left image here, top right, <clears throat> looking off to the side of the home out to the resource area of the Mashpee River. Um, and bottom left and bottom right, these uh, stakes show where uh, a large portion of the mitigation, this area here highlighted in that uh, light green yellow shade, that's um, this, these two areas here. Um, so bordering the uh, Mashpee River, this is where the bulk of uh, mitigation is proposed, and then there's other mitigation areas as well. Um, so looking at uh, top left again, this is standing right around the edge of Salt Marsh where those boulders are, uh, just above the upper Salt Marsh looking up towards the property. So here's the coastal beach area. This, this um, material here is the, the dock is currently being rebuilt, which is a previously permitted project. So that's why you see this uh, lumber here in the foreground. Um, Top right image, this is one of the beds, the existing garden beds, which has a lot of Rosa Vergosa and crushed clam shells. You can see these areas are part of the mitigation. You can see a better picture of both areas here in the bottom right photo. And this here on the bottom left, this is the area of the proposed pool and patio. So you can see it's all existing uh, turf lawn uh, currently. Um, so getting into my comments, Mark had covered a lot of this already, but um, there are provisions under our Regulation 33 which deals with um, lands within 200 feet of rivers and streams. And there are provisions, uh, this is in the comments that I had sent out to all the commissioners, um, <clears throat> that there is allow allowance for redevelopment within previously uh, developed areas of riverfront. Um, as long as the commission feels that the um, petitioner has 
proven that what is being requested will not adversely impact the performance standards for, uh, for the resource area for Riverfront. So um, one of the things that was initially missing from the narrative portion was a statement, uh, part of the narrative was to address um, equivalent alternatives uh, to provide an alternative scenario. Mark has since submitted those, although the commission hasn't had a chance to review them. I don't know, Mark, if you would just want to touch on that uh, for the commissioner's sake, because they, they were sent. Uh, did we send them? I did. We sent the, the commissioner's the update, but I think it would be good just to just to kind of review that section of the narrative um, for their edification. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, we did summarize um, one of the factors within that is um, economic alternatives. And, uh, you know, the site is entirely within the riverfront area. The real only economic alternative would be find another property in town that has a pool. So um, it's really not an equivalent economic um, option. Uh, the logistics of uh, the where we're putting the pool and patio is uh, um, it's is for the owner. It's it is in the favorable position, but on the site you'll notice on the site plan there is they also have a geothermal heat system in there in the yard off the other side of the deck. Um, yeah, it's right there. Uh, it's one of the, the owner said it's one of the more first ones in the town, so we can't put it in that area, um, which would be a little further to the bank. So logistic-wise, um, you know, we, we put the pool in this location. Um, and then another aspect of that section of the riverfront is uh, a um, is impact avoidance. Um, and although, you know, this work is close to the buffer or close to the bank and even touches the bank, um, I think between the riverfront area restoration we're proposing and the town's mitigation requirements, um, there really is a net benefit. Uh, there's over a thousand square feet of lawn being removed, and uh, with both the restoration and mitigation, it's almost I think 2,300 square feet of mitigation for this uh, 360 square foot uh, development. And uh, as you see on that, we also did just a, a side note. We did provide a dry well for the pool, drain down, and it will be a saltwater pool, just as a, a note. Um, I think there might have been a couple other sections. I didn't have that in front of me right now, but we did um, provide those alternatives. Um, alternatives. <clears throat> so, um, so I had cited. Uh, Regulation 33 under Chapter 172, the requirements for lands within 200 feet of rivers and streams, Section E5 allows for consideration of proposed accessory structures provided the applicant clearly demonstrate the proposed work does not impair the capacity of riverfront to provide important wildlife habitat functions. So you can see in this particular uh, property, they, you know, it is heavily developed, it's heavily landscaped, uh, and, you know, there aren't many areas of existing natural vegetation on the lot. And considering that, you know, the habitat value of this lot is just, just diminished, there really isn't much habitat. So I don't feel that this uh, proposed pool and patio is going to make conditions any worse. Um, and considering that the amount of mitigation to offset any sort of impacts that the pool patio may cause, I feel uh, I would recommend that um, that this meets that, that performance standard under our regulations, um, that the mitigation will certainly offset any impacts uh, from the proposed, proposed pool patio area. As you said, it's going over existing lawn, and you've got a lot of mitigation here that's currently landscaped, uh, or areas that are absent of any understory over here uh, that are identified on the plan, so I think uh, the lot would greatly develop, greatly benefit from, from increased um, mitigation. Uh, let's see if I have anything else. There was a, uh, there is a concern uh, that was raised from the uh, butter um, at 170 Captain's Row. And I'm just going to show, let me see if I have these. 
images here to show. So the, the concern before I show the images is that it's not related, it's somewhat related to the project, but it's, it's an underlying concern of uh, runoff issues from this property to, to the abutting property to the left. Um, let me go back to the uh, PowerPoint just to show you which property. This is 170 here. This is the subject property, 174. 170, so it's a, a lower lying elevation than some of the surrounding properties, so it receives a lot of runoff and drainage. But one of the things that was uh, presented to us by the abutter was showing some of the existing conditions here. This is the driveway, one of the side of the driveway uh, at 174 Captain's Row. They've got this cobble edge apron here leading into the driveway. And you can see some runoff occurring uh, from the driveway into the street and making its way over uh, to the to the abutting property. Um, let's show some other. Again, just showing which direction. There's the cobble apron, uh, and you've got um, a storm drain here that doesn't uh, handle quite all the load that comes into this area. Not it's not all coming from oh. 174, but oh, can, can, from can a lot of. Can you change your pictures? What's that? Can you change your pictures? I'm not you, seeing your pictures. Oh, you can't see them? Oh, I can only see the one over the top view of the property. Ah, okay. Hmm. You had them before, I think. Yeah, so you can't see these images I'm putting up? Shoot. Huh. No, we just see the aerial shot of the entire lot. Okay. Let me just see if I can... Do you want me to read the comment into record? Yeah. Well, what we'll do, we'll just read the comments from the abutter. Um, I can't figure out how to get these images shared. I apologize. Yeah, all the images were sent to you uh, earlier today as well um, yeah. via email. Yeah, right. right. So I saw, I saw look at this and the video. So I'll read the... Kate, Kate, Caitlin's message that was about 1240 this afternoon, that had some great video of the water running through the property and heading for the river. Right. I will read into record the comment from the abutter at 170 Captain's Row. We recently received information regarding the intent to install a pool and a deck next door to us and close to the lot line at 1.13.5 feet. After reviewing the plans, we have a concern. Form 1 states no flooding. Flooding is an issue. That is why we have a berm across the street side of our property for as long as I can remember and why the association has stalled a catch basin. Mr. Kelly sent correspondence to the Pirates Cove Beach Association with respect to his property flooding, which it has for years, even before he built his current home. When a new house was built diagonally across the street, the water flow increased. Mr. Kelly had the cobblestones at the end of his driveway raised and installed a drain underground from the street, which then comes up above ground and diverts the water onto our property, causing unprecedented flooding and erosion. Part of our retaining wall collapsed due to rushing water. Depending on the intensity of the rain, the water will also flow along both sides of the fence and reaches the area on the plans where the proposed pool would be. Mr. Kelly cannot continue to divert water from his property, which is causing a washout of our property and a washout of the beach, which in turn empties into the river. This is unacceptable and needs to be addressed. At this time, a pool will only make matters worse. Thank you for your time. Okay. So... Uh, I apologize that I can't show the pictures, but this is just an issue raised, and one of the things that, uh, one of the photos that we were sent that was forwarded to you showed a drain pipe um, right near the driveway, on this side of the driveway here, that apparently where, uh, where the pipe ends, it collects storm water, and then it's sending water onto the adjacent property. So we lo I looked into our permit history, and we don't have anything on file for that pipe. Uh, and because it is causing some issues with stormwater runoff to the adjacent property, I feel this is a good opportunity to address that issue. Um, perhaps Mark can speak to the homeowner and get this uh, situation resolved because uh, it's apparently causing a lot of issues with the neighbor. The neighbor is concerned that the pool patio area may exacerbate this condition. Um, so it's, I think it's something that you know, warrants uh, consideration and certainly, if it's something that we don't have any permitting history of, it should be addressed before the commission rules on this uh, on this particular application. So that's uh, that's my recommendation. In, in general, I, I don't have an issue with the proposed pool and patio. I think that the mitigation is certainly offsets any sort of impacts. But there is this issue that I think should be addressed 
prior to the commission ruling on it, but I wanted Mark to go forward with this presentation if the commission has any questions on the pool patio aspect of this proposal. Thank you, Drew. Questions from our commissioners? Um, I've got a question. Uh, it looks like on the plan I'm looking at, the pool is 13 and a half feet from the lot line. And I was just wondering, is there a variance for that? Does that meet the setback requirement? Um, according to the building department, I'll just read the comment now for them, that they need relief from ZBA for side setback. Okay, and that hasn't good. been issued yet? No, they typically, zoning likes to see CONCOM review projects before they yep. review them. Yep. Okay. Other questions? How deep is the pool? Um, I believe it's just four feet deep. I could check on that, but that's, I believe it's four, four, three or four feet. Little dump pool. Okay, thank you. Is anyone public comment waiting? Or? No, there's um, no. I have a Board of Health comments to read at some point. Well, Caitlin has some comments from the Board of Health as well. <laughs> Thank you. Required setbacks from poolside wall to tank and leaching are 10 foot and 20 foot respectively and must be maintained. Access to septic component covers must be maintained. Note the location of the septic system and restrict equipment vehicle traffic over non-load bearing H10 components. Thank you, Caitlin. Drew, do we have a uh, date for us to revisit the um, this application, or are we going to uh, let the applicant decide when they want to come back with the resolved resolution on the runoff and the abutter? Right, Mark, what do you what do you think? I I, I don't know. Our yeah. next meeting is March tenth. Um, do you think that's enough time to take a look at this runoff issue? Uh, it definitely is. Um, can I? I won't take a lot of time, but let me let me just take two minutes. Um, I did walk the site, um, so there is a catch basin out in the street, and um, eventually that catch basin um, gets overwhelmed by drainage coming both both ways of Captain's Row. Basically, this is the low point, and once that happens, you know it starts pound, ponding in the road. And as the neighbor described, they built a rather large berm up um, on their driveway, which then diverts the water and keeps it from going on their property. And eventually it overtops um, onto the 174 property. And what the pipe does is allows a slow, slower release, actually, of that runoff um, until it even the pipe gets overwhelmed and it just overtops that co cobble apron you see there on the plan, um, that cobble apron. So whether the pipe is there or not, it'll overtop that and head um, towards the river. Um, and eventually uh, it disperses as much as it can, but it, I, I think and I believe what those pictures are, but we're not sure if the pictures are before or after the pipe is installed. Um, Eventually, it, it just continues to go down and um, find a way towards that fence line, which is some of those pictures. So I'm not sure what any kind of resolution would be, but we can definitely look at it further. And, um, you know, uh, we would just continue this. The tents would be more than enough time, I think, to address this. And lastly, I, it's my professional opinion that the pool itself and that proposal uh, would not redirect any more uh, runoff that way. In fact, with all the lawn being removed and the added vegetation, hopefully even uh, reduce some runoff off the site. But, um, yeah, nah, the tent is uh, good for us. My, my comment would simply be I, I, I think you've got a serious problem here, but I'm not sure it's being caused by all of the other activities on the river side of the property. 
Well, it sounds to me like you got a problem where the property interfaces with Captain's Row. Is Captain's Row a town accepted by the town road? No, it's a privately owned road. Privately owned road. That I would say we do not allow this until the village, uh, the air, uh, whatever you call the community that uh, that Captain's Row uh, is a part of. Until they fix their problem, they're running from their property onto other people's property. And I cannot quote chapter and verse of our bylaws, but that's not that's not allowed. You cannot take from some person's one organization's property and dump it onto somebody else's problem and walk away. Somewhere in that village is doing the wrong thing. They're not maintaining their catch basins. Um, but, yeah, something needs to be done. I don't know if it's... I don't know if it's really, uh, I don't know if I would endorse holding up this project for something that would probably take quite some time to address and deal with. Uh, you know, I don't see how the two are related in that aspect. Um, so I would recommend that the commission, you know, uh, grant the continuance to see what could be worked out in the short term. But if you're talking about, you know, doing stormwater work on Captain's Row and holding this up to see how that pans out, you know, I, I don't think that's being fair to the homeowner uh, in this instance. I agree, I agree, Drew, but somewhere you need to wake somebody up and say this problem has been going on for a long time. The pictures that we've seen and the complaints that we've picked up from the neighbors, mm -hmm. it's been going on for a long time. How do we get their attention? It obviously neighbor to neighbor doesn't get the job done. Right. And, I have... and a homeowners association doesn't seem to be care much. Uh, and I think that somehow we, we ought to at least ask for a continuance to see whether, in fact, somebody's willing to step up a bit. All right. And, I, and I'd be more than willing to reach out to the Homeowners Association. I've worked with them on many other projects. They have a lot of beach area common association land throughout this whole subdivision. So I can certainly reach out to them in regards to, excuse me, to, this, to this issue of uh, stormwater runoff in this low-lying area. But we have a continuance date of March 10th at 6.21 p.m. Okay, thank you. I just also wanted to uh, let you know, Brad, that it looks like the association did provide, a deal, did build a berm at 170 Captain's Row, but of course it's to no avail as far as the situation goes. <laughs> who's called in to give commentary. No commentary. There's no further discussion. We'll entertain a motion. I'm not offering because I did not hear uh, correctly when we would continue to. Oh, uh, March 10th at 6.21 p.m. Okay, thank you. I will... I would move for a continuation of the application. I'm sorry, now I've got my of the the application of John S. and Carol D. Kelly at 174 Captain's Row. Continue it until 3:10, 6:21 p.m. for further consideration of correcting the drainage issue uh, that's impacting this project. Second. Is there any further discussion? The motion seconded. We'll vote. Paul? Yes. Brad? Yes. Brian? Yes. Yes. Tom? Aye. Charlie? Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mark is also representing the next project, Brad, so whenever you're ready, you can call the hearing for 603. Very good. Now calling the 603 hearing for Brendan P. Giblin, 90 Pompanesset Island Road. Proposed float uh, reorientation. Representative is Cape and Islands Engineering. This is an RDA. Good evening, Mark David Gamble. with Cape and Islands. Um, so uh, this was a submitted an RDA request 
Um, just going to get right to the proposed um, changes. And what they're doing is just relocating the existing float, existing same size float, just turning it to be essentially parallel to the coast, to being straight out. Um, it does require the two piles just to be relocated, but it does not need additional piles. Um, it's in over a foot and a half of water from mean low water. Um, we did uh, receive some initial feedback from the harbor master, and uh, he was concerned of the navigational channel. Um, but when we, we resubmitted this plan and basically the overall plan view up above this, um, where it shows the aerial, we basically expand you um, to give him a lot more information. The other, the original plan had quite limited view um, of this proposal, and he has since um, determined that the the change in the float will not affect um, navigation for this area. Um, that's all that's proposed is just to relocate the existing float. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. True comments? Uh, not too much more to add, just to um, show some photographs of the uh, project site. Top left here is uh, on the approach out to the coast uh, on the side of the property, um, looking out to the beginning of the dock. And then just some images of the existing dock. Um, there's no float present currently. Uh, so a couple of things that I just wanted to mention, considering this is an RDA proposal, which I'm fine with because it's a relatively minor uh, scope project in, in just reorienting a float and not adding any additional piles. However, I, I don't know, and Mark, maybe you can uh, clarify. I don't know if the existing float is encapsulated or not, or if it's exposed. Do you, do you know that information? Um, I don't, but um, it can be a condition that, right. you know, that it be encapsulated or be replaced with one that is, it's, I, I don't believe that would be an issue. Okay, good. Because, um, yeah, that would be my, my recommendation for encapsulation. And then our typical protocol when it comes to pile installation is that uh, jetting of piles is prohibited unless, uh, you know, there's limited jetting to set the piles, but they must be driven to refusal. So those are the two conditions that I would recommend be part of this RDA uh, request. And um, as was already stated by Mark, that the Harbor Master has signed off since being, uh, since offered clarification uh, on the separation of this dock, which you can see it's well separated from the, uh, from the two adjacent docks. Um, <clears throat> so there's no issues from the harbor master. Shellfish Constable also uh, does not consider this area to be a candidate for shellfish mitigation fee. He says it's a very minor uh, change in, in scope, project scope. So minimal alteration does not recommend a shellfish mitigation fee for this application. Thank you, Drew. Comments from the commissioners and questions. any commentary? Yeah, Board of Health just stated to note the location of the septic system and restrict equipment vehicle traffic over non-load bearing H10 components. Thank you. There's no further discussion. Is there anyone who's called in to make commentary? Nobody uh, calling in. Very good. If there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion. I would move that uh, in regards to the application of Brendan B. Kibble at 90 Papanesset Island Road, a proposed flight reorientation that uh, for a negative determination with the condition that, uh, that, the, that the float must be encapsulated uh, and that the jetting of the piles during construction is prohibited. Thank you, John. Thank you, Charlie. Now voting. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. 
I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Real, real quick, I, I apologize. I just wanted to state that the uh, res, resident at 89 Papadus and Island Road are 100% in favor of the float reorientation. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Mark is representing the next project, so uh, for 6.06 p.m., whenever you're ready to call it, Chad. Now calling the 6.06 hearing for Joseph H. Fall, the fourth, and Joan L. Fall, 192 Fells Pond Road, proposed septic system upgrade. Representative Cape and Highlands Engineering, this is an RDA. Uh, good evening, Mark, to begin with Cape and Islands. Um, so for this RDA, this is a septic upgrade only. Um, the, the septic system will be located in the front yard. It's um, at the closest point. It'll be approximately 92 feet away from the coastal bank. Um, it is an increase in flow going from two bedrooms to three bedrooms, um, but it is also has a microfast innovative alternative uh, nitrogen reducing system. Um, it does not require uh, any Board of Health uh, variances and fits into the front of the property, um, essentially in the same footprint as the existing system, just the capacity is being increased uh, slightly. Uh, that's the proposal. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. True comments? Um, just to read Board of Health comments. Sure. The septic permit application filed with B has been filed with BOH and design plans have been approved. Issuance of septic permit pending payment of fee. And just some images to show the commission. Going back to the uh, plan here, you can see this uh, septic work is all taking place within the existing driveway layout. So going back to the... Uh, PowerPoint images here is the, uh, this is the area of septic installation. It's a gravel driveway. Uh, just a couple other images. Um, let me just go back to the uh, GIS image here. So it's kind of one of those pork chop shaped lots, but you've got uh, Coastal Bank leading down to Fells Pond here. And um, go back to the Sorry. So just to show, you've got a pretty nice thick buffer here, naturally vegetated buffer strip going down the coastal bank leading to a uh, existing platform dock on Fells Pond. Um, just so the commission is aware, the reason this is designated as coastal bank is that it's, uh, it's within the flood zone. Fells Pond is within the mapped flood zone. It's also ACEC. Um, though it's under 10 acres in size, uh, so it's not considered a great pond, but it's still mapped within the Wakoyat Bay watershed as, uh, as ACEC. But no part of this project is within the ACEC boundary. So, but just to clarify why, it, why it's designated as Coastal Bank instead of Inland Bank. And no other comments. Thank you, Drew. Caitlin? No other comments. <clears throat> Questions and comments from our commissioners? <clears throat> I think we should point out at this point that, uh, that no matter how much, uh, we must point out that uh, that there w tonight there was no argument with Drew in regards to whether Fells Pond is a great pond or not. <laughs> for, for the history is that that was an ongoing contention for many years. The, the previous chairman many years ago was convinced that this is not a, a great pond. Mm -hmm. And Drew has accepted the recommendation of the chairman, the past chairman. <laughs> Although it could become a, it could be a great bond when you get enough rain. It's right on the it's right on the fringe. <laughs> it's that close. It's that yes. close to being a great pond. Right. <laughs> but a pretty good bond. <laughs> All right, questions, comments from our commissioners. There's no further discussion. Is there anyone who's called in? Nobody has called up for commentary, public comment. We'll entertain a motion. 
I would move for a negative termination in regards to Joseph H. Paul and Joan L. Paul, 192 Fells Pond Road, in regards to the proposed new septic system upgrade at 192 Fells Pond Road. Second. Thank you, Charlie. There's no further discussion. We'll begin voting. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Can we roll right into 609, Drew? Yes. Now calling the 609 hearing for Patrick J. and Nisa R. Knight, 25 Tide Run. Proposed additions to existing single family home modifications to existing pier and mitigation plantings. Cape and Islands Engineering, this is an NOI. So this uh, application has been requested to be continued to March 10th at 6.03 p.m. Thank you. Do I hear a motion? I would move for a continuation of the application of Patrick J. and this uh, K. I kiss it. R. Knight, 25 Tide Run, continue their application for additions to their home to 6.03 p.m. on March 10th. Thank you, Brad. Is there a second? Second. There's no further discussion. We'll begin voting. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. Vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, and we're uh, we're set to go for the next one at six um, six twelve p.m. Thank you, Drew. Now calling the six twelve. PM hearing for John Lawrence, 59 Coupel Road, proposed installation of seasonal dock. The representative is Green Seal Environmental. Uh, this is Nanoa. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jose Pichardo, project manager with Green Seal Environmental. Property contains 1.7 acres of land located on Stone Residential R5 and used as a single family. The resource area were field delineated by Garrett Tunison, wetland scientist with uh, Tunison Environmental. And they were located with uh, on the ground as a total station, as it is shown on the plan. Uh, however, no work is proposed within uh, these regulated areas. Since the proposed seasonal dock will be within the land underwater as shown on the proposed plan as well. This land is also known as John Pond, designated as a great pond in the state. We are seeking permit for the installation of a seasonal dock. The overall dimensions are 40 feet long by four feet wide or 160 square feet. The proposed dock is lightweight prefabricated aluminum with uh, four sections, 10 by four. The installation and removal does not require power tools, since all components will be uh, quick connect to fit, quick pins. Um, essentially, it's a two-person job. Uh, that should be designed to bypass at least 50% lighting. And overall, we trust that the proposal meets all performance standards for seasonal dogs within great ponds. Uh, now I'm, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Drew, comments? Um, not too much to add to this. It's pretty straightforward as a seasonal dock. So uh, as Jose had stated, there's no real construction involved. This is really just assembly uh, and then placement into the water. Um, one of the things one of the things we're still awaiting is commentary um, a determina determination letter from Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program 
As the commissioners are aware, John's Pond is mapped as rare species priority species habitat, uh, namely for a few different species of freshwater mussel. So we haven't received the letter yet. This is pretty common that the, the two timelines don't always match up with hearings and determination letters. So what our recommendation is, is if the commission is um, going to approve this project, which we do recommend approval, the motion be pending receipt of a determination letter from Natural Heritage as part of your, uh, part of your motion. No other comments, uh, Harbor Master. Caitlin will have a Harbor Master and Shellfish. Yep, um, no shellfish comments, but Harbor Master states that the proposed seasonal dock for 59 Hoople Road and found that there are no navigational concerns. Um, and Board of Health states that to, uh, to note the location of the septic system and restrict equipment vehicle traffic over non-load bearing H10 components. And just to show some images of the site, um, we've got top left, this is the existing cottage. Um, off of Hoophole Road bordering John's Pond. And then you've got the uh, shoreline here. There's probably some small area of BBW uh, right on the, along the shoreline here. But no clearing of any native vegetation, trees, no alteration of vegetation, just simply placing, you kind of see this orange marker right here. This is where the dock is going to go out into the water. So very minimal um, uh, work involved and no alteration. Um, and then if Natural Heritage has comments, we would simply incorporate them into an order conditions, but the orders would not be issued until we receive that letter. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Caitlin. Questions and comments from our commissioners? <clears throat> Hearing none, has anyone called in to make public commentary? No. No public comment. If there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion. Keep in mind the suggested uh, caveat from our uh, conservation agent. Absolutely. I would uh, ask that we close and issue this application of Ron and Tara Riesenberger. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped John Lawrence, 59 Hoophole Road, that we close and issue this application for a seasonal dock and that we approve it with the condition that the, that the application must be approved by National Heritage. Second. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Charlie. If there's no further discussion, we'll begin voting. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. It's continued. 198 fills 20. Mm -hmm. oh. No DEP number. Oh, got it. Okay. And same with 46. Okay. Back. The next two. Um, Projects are proposed to be continued, Chad, so if you want to open up each one and we'll provide the uh, continuance information. Very good. Six, six, now calling the 615 for Ron Tara Riesenberger. 198 Fells Pond Road, proposed installation of a fixed platform access deck and canoe rack. Representative Shorefer Consulting, this is NOI. So this project has been requested to be continued to March 10th at 6.18 p.m. There's an offer of a discussion or when you a motion. I would, I would move that at the request of the applicant, uh, Ron I or Ron L and Tara A. Riesenberger at 198 Fells Pond Road to be continued to 310, March 10th at 6.18 p.m. So I hear a second. Thank you, Charlie. Voting. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you.
Now opening the 618 hearing for Julie Silva and Martin Riley, 46 Little Neck Lane. Proposed demolition and reconstruction of single family home and mitigation planning. BSS design. This is Nenawai. And this uh, application has been requested to be continued, like the last one for this one as well. As, uh, no DEP number has been issued yet for, for these projects. So it's requested to be continued to March 10th at 6.15 p.m. There's no further discussion. We'll hear a motion. At the request of the applicant, we would, we would continue this application of Julie Silva and Mark J. Riley at 46 Little Neck Lane, March 10th at 6.15 p.m. Thank you, Brad. Do we hear a second? Second. Thank you, Charlie. Voting. Brad? Yes. Paul? Yes. Tom? Aye. Brian? Yes. Charlie? Yes. But I as well, motion carried. Thank you. Like we're ready for our next Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, now calling the 621 hearing for Michael J. and Jennifer B. Kohler. Uh, 220 Wadding Place Road, proposed landscape, hardscape modifications, and mitigation planting. The representative is BSC Group, who continued from 210 uh, for the DP number, and this is Nenawai. Paul, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Loud and clear. Yep. Um, uh, are you still in the plan, or should I get that up on my screen? Oh, I can, yeah, I can put it up here. Yep. <clears throat> okay. So, yes, uh, my name is Paul Mancuso. Uh, good evening. I'm with the BSC group, and I'm presenting a notice of intent for proposed home improvements at 220 Waiting Place Road for Michael and Jennifer Scholler. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the existing site is a single-family home. They have a pool with patio, as you can see in the aerial. Um, they have a driveway right under the right beneath the cursor, which is a gravel driveway. And um, so the proposed improvement is that the, they would like to expand the patio around the pool, and they're actually going to replace the existing patio with a new type of paver. That honeycomb pattern you see on the plan is where they are expanding the, or where the existing patio will be replaced and expanded. Um, so that it's expanding around the pool and it going along in front of the house and along the road. The gravel driveway, um, that center portion that is not the honeycomb pattern, will remain gravel. They are expanding the driveway um, to the right, so it's essentially going to be um, twice as wide. So they can fit two cars side by side, um, parked in the driveway, and um, as I mentioned, it will be gravel in the center, that um, paper hardscape around the edges. And one of the other improvements they are proposing is they have an existing um, pool equipment, which is... Uh, right there, yep, in that little that little box to the right of the pool. They're going to relocate the pool equipment. Yep, that's where it is. They're going to relocate it to the opposite corner, the uh, western corner of the property. Um, yep, right over there. So there's uh, two little rectangles there. They are proposing to relocate the pool pump in that location as well as install a generator for the house. Those will both be situated on top of uh, matching pavers for the hardscape in the front. Um, additionally, they have stairs leading from the pool area into the backyard. They're going to redo those stairs in the same location, but they are going to add a couple stepping stones down into the yard, um, which are shown right there. Yep. And they're also going to add two stepping stones off of the stairs from the first floor deck in the back. You can see those on plan. Yep, right there. And... Um, the last improvement, they are going to add a dry well in the backyard um, to collect runoff from the um, impervious surface around the house um, as an improvement. And so um, on site, you have, um, the house is located on Pomp Pompanessa Creek, associated with um, Pompanessa Bay. The, to the north 
And sort of west, there is a coastal bank. You can see that top coastal bank line running along the edge of the property there. Um, there is salt marsh down by the water, in there, and behind that would be coastal dune. So you have a top of dune, and um, to the right of the property, you would have a uh, beach beyond the dune. But so um, quite a bit of resources um, on the property, but all of the work that's proposed is about as far away from the resource areas as they could be. And um, we use the mass fee mitigation planting calculation sheet on the conservation website. And we determined that 1,078 square feet of mitigation were required from the proposed improvements. We are um, proposing uh, just a little bit more than that at 1,109 square feet. Um, on the plan, um, if you scroll down just a little, um, in the backyard, around the edge of the backyard is existing um, vegetation, but we are proposing to thicken those buffer zones, and we're going to add in some American beach grass along the edges of the backyard, um, just above your cursor, like in that lobe of the backyard, these hashed areas are um, proposed American beach grass. And then to the north of the house, right along the top of the coastal bank, we are proposing a variety of um, fallen shrubs uh, mixing with beach grass as well. And so... Um, the, the table on the top lists all the plant species and the key, um, the two or three little letter symbols on the left of that table indicate what plants will be going where when you look on a plan there. They're um, showing which plants are going where. And so um, with that, we're, we're proposing slightly more mitigation than would be required um, based on the proposed improvements. And so um, with that, I'd like to take any questions from the commission. Thank you very much. Drew, comments? Not too much to add. I uh, just want to show some images of the site. Um, I'll just preface this, the images. There's a lot of work going on on the external surface, uh, immediate areas of the house footprint, uh, shingling, siding, things like that. So you'll see that uh, in the images that were taken um, this week. So there, there is some work going on here, but it's all on the existing home. Uh, so top left here, this just shows the driveway area where there's going to be expansion uh, to accommodate two cars side by side. All of this work is, uh, is taking place within entirely predisturbed, legally previously altered areas. Um, top right image here, the right image is the existing patio area and pool, so these areas are going to be expanded with hardscaping, and I guess this is going to be swapped out with different type of... Uh, hardscaping um, patio areas around the pool. There's some other images looking at the seaward side of the home. Um, there's uh, looking out at the resource areas. You've got uh, coastal dune, coastal bank over here, uh, an existing uh, lawn leading up to the resource areas. And just some other images showing this, the existing deck, uh, pool patio area on the bottom left. And then you've just got uh, uh, other areas that have been previously altered around uh, the side and rear of the home. Uh, and again, just another shot. This is on the, uh, on the back side of the home. Again, coastal dune area here uh, and coastal bank uh, in this area. So um, as I stated, all the work is taking place within previously altered areas. And... Um, we had uh, some discussions with BSC on the initial placement of uh, mitigation, which has since been shown on, on a revised plan. They had a mitigation around the existing home originally, and we wanted to see it uh, placed out closer to the areas of coastal bank, closer to, the zones, closer to the seaward side of those uh, resource areas. So they, they did uh, provide that in a revised plan. Um, so that... Uh, yeah, see, what did, I, uh, what did I do with the plan? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so as Paul had described, uh, that mitigation has been relocated per our recommendation. So um, overall, it meets the performance standards of all the resource areas. There's no impact to, uh, to the resource areas themselves. But due to the proximity and setback to these resource areas, it does trigger mitigation. And we believe that they've uh, cited the mitigation in areas that are certainly... Um, most appropriate. Um, so just going back to the plan here. So 
these areas here, just to enhance these buffer zones around uh, the existing uh, grass area and just to beef up these buffer zones to coastal dune and coastal bank. Uh, you have any comments from? Yeah, Board of Health um, just states that the access to septic component covers must be maintained, note the location of the septic system and restrict equipment vehicle traffic over non-load bearing H10 components. We also uh, will require two hard copies of the revised plan that show the February 3rd uh, revision date for the mitigation changes. We can get that to you. Right. If it had not. Yeah, no other comments. Drew, uh, when you've been out on the site, uh, where this plan in front of us now, I, no, wait a minute. Do I, I think I may have brought a plan up and overlaid what you had, but there, it, the plan that I believe you have shows a path coming from the, I guess I would say it's the, the east side of the plan and coming out from that pool area and it curves around over to the beginning of the spit. Oh, right here, can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hang on, let me, let me get myself back to where I should be. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm wondering, is that pre-disturbed or is that new? It looked pretty virgin to me as I walked coming in from the spit and as I came in off of the beach from Papanessa to try to figure out exactly what was going on out there. I know the area reasonably well. I wanted to feel comfortable about it. And it looked to me like that vegetation had never been previously disturbed right there at the, as the seagrass area moves on to the sandy beach. Are you referring to this right here, Brad, where I've got the uh, Hang on. I've, I've, I've got to uh, somehow get back to it. i got to get back into the meeting, so hang on. Hang, uh, yes, I'm talking about, uh, you can't see my curse. Yeah, right just about there where the, where the pier stops. Right. And then this plan doesn't go further, but that line yep. right there, goes, where, it, where it leaves the plan, uh, cuts across, which I would say is virgin, uh, upper, um, I don't know what my term should be, but the upper area of the beach right. where it turns into a vegetated area and uh, it, it is totally virgin at this point. Yeah, so that uh -huh. is, it's, it's actually um, part of another proposal which has been requested to be continued, uh, but but it's, it's, uh, it's taking place on 228. It's it's under 228 and 220 Waiting Place Road, but that's not okay. what's being presented as far as this application. This is just relegated to the work around the existing home, but that will be brought before the commission. This this aspect, this uh, it's a proposed boardwalk that's going to allow access from 228 and 220 to get to this dock and pier, but it's not part of the application that you're looking at currently. It will be. Okay, so um, but there, save, it's a separate. Save the Bay will be represented at that discussion? Um, they, sh they should probably, I mean, they are in a butter, so they were notified um, as part of this application. I, I would think so, because it's, it could very easily, depending upon what Save the Bay does, it could create traffic onto their very valuable land. Right, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess we'll wait and see. We can certainly reach out to them just to make sure that they, you know, received um, notices and a butter. But I haven't heard any feedback. But but this, just so you know, this this even though it's shown on this plan, isn't what's being presented as part of this application. There are two two different okay. applications. One is for both properties, and one of this is just two twenty waiting place for which just deals with this uh, changes around the single family home and then the mitigation as a result. Well, that would be good if they could participate because this whole area is being redisturbed, should we say, and uh, therefore I, I caught that as I was walking at trying to get to the site in various ways because there were so many cars down the road. <laughs> you sure. couldn't even get in here. Right. Yeah. I, so, I, anyway. We'll, 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 make, we'll make sure that, you know, if there's any concerns, we'll, we'll certainly reach out to them to let them know. Thank you. Yep. Other comments? Hey, Linda, do we have any board of health? Oh, board of health. Didn't I already say that? 
Did she already say it? If not, we'll repeat it. <laughs> Access to septic component covers must be maintained. Note the location of septic system or restrict equipment vehicle traffic over non-load bearing H10 components. Thank you. Other comments from the commissioners? Is there anyone who's called in to make public commentary? Nobody's calling in. There's no further discussion. We'll entertain a motion. I would move that we, uh, at the request of the applicant, continue this application to March 10th, the application no, of no, Michael uh, J. and Jennifer G. Stoller. No, no continuance request for this one. That, it's, I'm sorry, Brad, it's, it's the one following this, not, not the current one. <laughs> this, is, okay, uh, so this is 621. 620, we're talking 621, okay. Right. Apologize. Right. Uh, this whole project has confused me, but in any case, uh, we want to we want to uh, close an issue in regards to the application of Michael J. and Jennifer G. Scola at 220 Waiting Place Road. Uh, Second, I heard I heard no conditions, folks. There was there any conditions? No, no conditions. Here. No. Okay, so that's it. That's the motion. With a motion and a second, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll begin voting. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Bob. I. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you. Now calling the 624 hearing, Michael J. and Jennifer G. Scholar, 220 Waiting Place Road. And 228 Waiting Place Road. Proposed construction of elevated boardwalk and mitigation plannings. Representative of the BSC Group. This is an NOI and has been requested to be continued. What would be the date of that continuance? So the uh, request is for um, March 10th at 6.06 .06 p.m. If there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion. Do I hear anything? Do I hear anything? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hearing none, I would uh, request at the request of the applicant, Michael J. and Jennifer G. Scholar, 220 Waiting Place Road and 228 Waiting Place Road, uh, to continue this application until 606 .06 on March 10th. <clears throat> There's no further discussion. In our sick mouth. Is there a second? <laughs> there we go. Voting. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Tom. I. Brian. Yes. And Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank uh, thanks, you. Drew. Thanks, Commission. Thank you. Am I to uh, judge that by the um, current preview we see for 30 sand dollar lane that the 630 is requested to be continued? Uh, this is the uh, 627. 627? Yeah. All right. Now calling the 627 for Austin P. and Christina L. Westerling. 688 Great Neck Road South. Proposed load expansion and licensing of existing kayak loads. Cape and Islands Engineering, NOI requested to be continued to what date, Mr. McMahon? March 10th at 6.09 p.m. With no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion from Brad. You guys are tough. <laughs> Make me earn my money. Uh, I would move the, the application of Austin P. and Christina L. Westerling at 688 Gretnick Road South. To close an issue, no, to continue it until March 10th, 6.09 p.m. Thank you, Brad. Right here, second. Second. With no further discussion, we'll begin voting. <clears throat> Brad. Yes. Paul. Uh, yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. 
I vote aye as well. Motion carried. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And we can move on to, um, I'm just going to skip ahead on the pre-post to an administrative approval request for 30 Sand Dollar Lane. Andrew Garraway is here to present this administrative uh, request. This is uh, under an issued order of conditions 43-3145 for a teardown rebuild of existing single family home and associated appurtenances. Andrew, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Andrew? Just give him a moment to uh, log on. I did invite him into the meeting. I'm gonna put up the uh, obligatory display. Curiosity, Drew, did we need to address the 633 public commentary? Oh, yes. I wanted to hold off on that till the end, uh, just right after this administrative approval request. No problem. Yeah. Looks like Andrew's dialing. Okay, I don't have to call. Okay. You hear me? It's like you got a party going there, bro. <laughs> That's our noisy, our noisy neighbors. <laughs> Andrew, can you hear us? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Ready when you are. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we came before you and uh, we got our plan approved for the raise and replace of the house at the end of um, 30 Sand Dollar Lane. And after that, we went to the Zoning Board of Appeals where we had um, some significant issues regarding um, having a, a three-story house. So the architect went back to the drawing board and um, reduced the upper story of the house um, because the basement was being considered a first floor. Um, and while he did that, we also made more room for the septic system in, under the driveway, and we moved the proposed garage from being a detached garage to being an attached garage, which kind of shrunk up the building footprint. Um, we did not change the, uh, nothing got closer to the wetland resource areas, so the walls nearest the resource areas remained the same, but we did expand the driveway because we moved the garage um, so that we could actually accommodate a couple of cars in that driveway. If you went to that site, you would have noticed that the driveway was um, very small and very steep. This also allowed us to flatten that driveway. Um, doesn't really show up on the picture very well how steep that is, but um, my minivan bottoms out going over the berm. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so um, in essence, we did expand hardscape in the 50 to 100 because of the driveway being over that septic system, but um, we had excessive mitigation proposed already and we didn't change that, um, and the house itself shrunk down. Um, we removed some walls because the basement was being considered a first floor, no matter what we did uh, due to a, a Mashpee ordinance. Um, we were able to reduce the retaining walls around the end of the house and on the south side of the house, height from the height was able to be reduced because we didn't need to put fill around the house anymore. Uh, we didn't have to put as much fill around the house anymore due to that basement issue. Um, and I did add a little bit of retaining wall um, from the garage, south of the garage toward the uh, cul-de-sac. Um, yeah, that was all the same. It, it's down uh, from at the south, the bottom of the bottom of the page, oh. the bottom of the site. Yeah. I extended that retaining wall so we could level out that driveway better, make it as kind of a safer, more functional site. But we redo we took away wall, 
where the two AC units are on the south side of the house, we took away some retaining wall that was there. Um, also, the roof line changed, which is going to be much, uh, not anything to do with you guys, but it's going to be much more satisfactory to the abutters' views um, because it's now going to be a, a, a half story on the top rather than a full story. Um, but uh, that's, that's uh, all the change that really was. Um, much better septic system um, situation under the driveway. And uh, that's about it, I think. Thank you very much. Drew, comment? Uh, nothing much to add. It's all pretty straightforward under um, the previously approved work limit, so no change in the work limit from what was originally requested, just some modifications to the garage location, driveway, and septic based on zoning board feedback. So recommend a, uh, an approval of the administrative request. Discussion from our commissioner. Yes, I want to ask Andrew, uh, you don't show your vegetation at the, well, at the left side of this particular plan that is in front of us. Uh, but on that, one of your other plant landscape plans for 30 Sand Dollar Lane here, you're showing a great deal of additional vegetation uh, going in. It doesn't talk about the height this, of those, those plants in that area that, that the cursor is moving across. Yes, Brad, this is the engineer's plan. I don't know if you should have the uh, landscape plan too, Drew. Could we see that? Yeah, I unfortunately I didn't, uh, I didn't load it into this presentation. That's my fault, but if you want to... Share it if you, or yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, if you, you could do that because it, this is, a, it's really an eye yeah, mitigation to try to see it, it and determine the which. Didn't change at all from what was there before. So we still have that extensive amount of mitigation on the west end of the property and right. along the, the, uh, the north, along the, the bay. And, and some on the other side as well. This mitigation previously met with our approval. Yes. Yeah, we have 1,500 1, square feet of mitigation on the site with a number of trees because we had to remove a couple of trees or a few trees on, on this. Um, so the mitigation didn't change. It, it's the same as what you approved. If I just ask a question that uh, in regards to the height of the mitigation, you know, we sat there for, what, an hour and a half with the neighbors to the lower oh. left corner of this plan. Yes, and in, in uh, between, yeah, I'm sorry, in between the, the, the plan that you approved, I made some mo mo modifications to the um, mitigation that, um, that Drew was able to approve. So I changed some oak trees to two below trees along the west end, and we relocated um, a proposed cedar tree to another area of the mitigation that took it out of the abutters' view. So we did do some uh, significant work with the abutter to, to satisfy them on uh, the, the mitigation not being uh, blocking them as much as it originally had. And, and quite frankly, I got to believe you gave the homeowner a much better view. At the end of that home, uh, all you're doing is looking down uh, Hawkway Bay at that particular point in time. If those trees had grown up, they probably would have been disappointed anyway. But the neighbor is disappointed. Whatever you can do, I think at least um, I have a wrong hat on at this particular point in time. The homeowners yeah. association would like to at least try and I think you're trying. That's all you can ask. They have no right or privilege to the view, but if you can help them, that's all you can do you're asking. Yeah, we sure did. We put some time in with, with the uh, immediate abutter um, uh, uh, to, to uh, make, make her a little bit more satisfied with, with that situation. Okay, thanks. Other comments from our commissioners? <clears throat> Anyone called in to make public commentary? No. No. Hearing none, if there's no further discussion, we'll entertain a motion for administrative approval. 
I would move that we approve uh, the actions that were taken here this evening for 30 Sand Dollar Lane. I'm stumbling for my words here, but we want to approve the, the modifications at 30 Sand Dollar Lane in the order of conditions. Thank you, Brad. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Charlie. There's no further discussion, we'll vote. Brad. Yes. Paul. Yes. Tom. Aye. Brian. Yes. Charlie. Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Turn back to you, Andrew. Sure. I'm going to put up, uh, I just want to, can all of you see this regulation 12 that I just put up on the screen or can nobody see that? Uh, yeah, it. Don't see it. Okay. I don't know how to get these up on the screen. Okay. Well, <clears throat> so looking at the, uh, moving on to the agenda item <clears throat> for 6.33 PM was this public comment for proposed amendments to Regulations 12, Mitigation, and 27, Docks, Piers, and Floats under Mashpee's Chapter 172, Wetland Bylaw. <clears throat> we didn't receive any comments or questions uh, since this was posted on the agenda and advertised in the paper. Um, don't believe anyone's called in at this point. However, I, I did, I'm sorry, I did receive comment from uh, a resident who had uh, requested copies of the existing language proposed amendments and uh, since sent those off and uh, she brought up a good point in that the um, she was wondering why these documents weren't posted on our website which they really should have been so what I propose is that this be uh, extended public comment period for the next meeting to March 10th so that we can post these um, existing language and proposed changes on our website and advertise it again for uh, for the next agenda, just so we can be as transparent as we can possibly be. It was a good point. It was an oversight on my part, and uh, I agree that really they sh you know we should have posted these online, you know particularly given the remote format of the meeting, um, so that uh, everyone had a chance to read them who may have been interested in in commenting on these regulations. So. Um, with the commission's blessing, if that's okay, to just extend this public comment and allow us the chance to post these changes online for full transparency. There's no time. I support the uh, the effort to do so. Is this something that we can do going forward when we have things of this nature, make it standard operating to go up on the website? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think another idea, Drew, I don't know whether you can do that because it might be changing the process that's out of the approval is could we you know solicit the uh, the, the mashby enterprise to get someone to cover this as a story so that if they happen to subscribe to the newspaper they might get better than walking through the town hall or taking the time to go to the website sure it, it, could certainly it might stumble across it if nothing else yeah yep absolutely I'll, I'll make it a point to reach out to the enterprise and just give them a heads up that this is something that's, you know, that we're encouraging as much exposure to the public as possible so we can engage in public comments uh, for anyone but who's interested. I was also uh, probably showing my age by suggesting go to a paper, newspaper. Maybe it should be in social media someplace. Yeah, we can put it up. Uh, that's a good point, Brad. Um, is that we can put it up on the town's Facebook page. Very good. Yeah. yeah. If nobody responds to that, if nobody responds to that, then people truly don't care. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the whole point. <laughs> the news bulletin too. Yeah. And there's also the news bulletin on the town's website. So we'll, we'll, we'll advertise it as much as we possibly can. Um, get the word out. But, uh, yeah, I just I just want to make sure that nobody comes back and says I didn't hear about this. You guys didn't do enough to put it out there. So I just want to make sure we cover all those bases before we uh, get past we the need, public comment period. Do we need to vote to extend the period, or is that something you can do? We'll just put it on the agenda for March 10th. You don't need to vote. Perfect. Yeah. Great. 
Okay. Any other discussion on the issue? All right. Back okay. to our uh, pre-post items, Joe. Sure. So uh, just a couple of updates, uh, Redbrook Road, Culbert, there's ongoing assessment uh, of the existing conditions from Horsley Witten Group. They're the hire consultant to take a look at the area, try to find out what led to the culvert failure. They're just waiting for maximum drainage uh, in the area uh, so that they can, you know, perform a thorough uh, investigation of what led to the culvert failure and the existing conditions to make... Uh, conceptual um, proposals for potential restoration out there. So that's still ongoing. Um, no new updates from the upper quotient, though we are anticipating uh, the finality of phase one and a conceptual restoration plan, hopefully coming soon. Um, bylaw review subcommittee, we just went over all of that. We're gonna extend the public comment period. And I'm gonna start working on uh, some additional articles uh, for the subcommittee to start looking at uh, additional uh, amendments to regulations for the subcommittee to look at. Um, so we'll keep that ongoing. We have submitted our articles for funding for milfoil eradication. That's what remains on John's Pond and uh, what is existing on Santuit Pond. So those articles have been submitted to the town manager's office for selectman review. And I'll give everybody a heads up uh, when that's taking place, maybe it would be good to attend that meeting once it's scheduled uh, just to advocate for, for our articles. Um, and I'll hand it over to Caitlin for some updates to the Chop Shake Bog project. Sure. We uh, submitted our request for proposals um, for uh, the second phase of the project for final permitting or for final design and permitting. The due date for those proposals is March 2nd, and we will be reviewing those with the in-lieu fee program as soon as they're received. We're planning uh, right now to review them the week of March, uh, March 7th. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, that's, um, that's all we got. The violations. Oh, I'm sorry. That is not all we have. Uh, just kidding. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a couple of updates on violations that we've discovered. They're particularly egregious, too. Um, 424 Monomaskoy Road, this was, we were alerted to this from uh, a resident across the water body who had noticed that uh, it appeared that wetlands were being filled in. And uh, as once we investigated, that's exactly what was happening. This is a project that was actually issued an order of conditions for a teardown a rebuild of the home, uh, replacement of existing patio area with a pool, so no expansion toward the wetland, and then regrading of the lawn in the backyard with uh, a proposed berm to separate lawn area from uh, the wetland edge, which is bordering vegetated wetland and salt marsh, uh, but only raising the grade by six inches, and then uh, seeding uh, compliant lawn seed under Chapter 172. So what had happened was um, significantly more fill was brought in and riprap stone was installed along the edge of, uh, of the fill. And a significant portion of the fill was put, placed in over bordering vegetated wetland and salt marsh, so essentially covering it over. Uh, <coughs> pretty significant area. So we've we followed up with the homeowner. We're in the process of issuing an enforcement order, seesaw work on the property. Uh, including the pool and patio area. Um, and the first step is for them to remove the fill, remove all riprap by hand, and um, so we can investigate what the impacts are and how much wetland area has been filled in or was filled in. And then uh, the enforcement order will, will have um, requirements of the hiring of a wetland consultant to assess the impacts of what took place to the BBW and salt marsh and then make recommendations for uh, restoration, which under our bylaw is a two to one restoration for any areas of salt marsh that have been adversely impacted through fill. Um, so that's ongoing. Um, the other one is out on 49 uh, Riverside Road, which is on Seconset Island. And again, unfortunately dealing with salt marsh where a trench was dug into salt marsh and riprap stone placed out there. We're not really quite sure. We've just in the initial stages of 
corresponding with the contractor who conducted the work and the homeowner is now not, not on Cape Cod, um, but they've been alerted to the uh, issuance of a stop work order. We were initially told that this is rebuilding of an old rock wall, but going back in GIS imagery, I don't see any previously existing wall and I, I don't see any evidence of a wall existing in this area. But again, it's, it's alteration of salt marsh, which is unfortunate. Um, but again, we'll be following up accordingly and it'll likely be in the enforcement order that we're going to issue a two to one mitigation uh, ratio for restoration. So a couple of really bad violations, unfortunately, dealing with uh, salt marsh alteration. Um, but we're, uh, we're on top of it and um, we'll keep you all updated. What's the address of that violation? Uh, first address is 424 Monomascoy Road. Okay, so and it's on Monomascoy. The other one is 49 Riverside, which is on um, Seconset Island. Right, okay, thank you. Sure. Now we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments, questions, or business before the commission? Here. Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion for adjournment. Move to adjourn. <laughs> I'm, 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 my voice is getting tired. <laughs> Do I hear a second? Second. If there's no further discussion, we'll vote. Brad? Yes. Paul? Yes. Tom? Aye. Brian? Yes. Charlie? Yes. I vote aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Drew and Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.